It's the next level. Hey panelers, welcome to the show. I'm Steve. And I'm Laura. And this is going to be a spoiler-full podcast of the third episode of The Witcher Season 2. Title is What is Lost? And we have a uh, kind of small synopsis here with just impatient with Geralt's message. Siri braves major obstacles to prove her mettle. Scheming and suspicion among the Brotherhood make Yennefer a target. Succinct. <laughs> Succinct and to the point. Yeah, it, that covered it all and, and uh, really, really good. Uh, how'd you feel about this episode? What'd you think? Um, I thought it was overall an okay episode. Um, nice surprise in there and a good ending with the monster battle. And the surprise was Yennefer showing up alive at Eratusa. So I, I liked that. I'll give it a solid uh, 7 out of 10 Witcher Course Cracks to the Skull. <laughs> <laughs> that's good that's good i i actually liked it a lot more the second time like the first time i just kind of watched it, i was just kind of like mm, okay um but then today as i was watching it again i really really got into it and, and had a lot more notes than i thought i was gonna have and so it's it's gonna be uh it's gonna be kind of fun to see where the discussion takes us but i i did watch uh nightmare of the wolf and uh it was really good i'm usually not into animated stuff but uh it was it was good and it did help kind of understand some of what's going on here especially with you know uh we're, we're kind of starting into a storyline that might uh tie back to nightmare of the wolf right with these mutated monsters but we'll get more <laughs> into that uh as we get into our our discussion points but uh, the only question i had is there at the end of nightmare of the wolf why was girl bald what <laughs> now i thought about that, that? Choice? and the, maybe one he maybe had lice and they had to shave his head. <laughs> and another, I just think it's because since he's the only witcher with white hair, if we saw some white-haired little child, then we would immediately know it's Geralt. Although, oh. in the series, the little boy who gets left with Vesemir is not white, does not have white hair. So, I yeah, don't know. The, the, That's the only the thing I could think of, though. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. It was just gonna, it kind of threw me off a little bit. And I also noticed that in the, in the, the, cartoon vesemir has the yellow had the yellow eyes mm -hmm. yeah also most but, of the witchers do and in, in in the series it's only Geralt who has the yellow eyes yeah that's that's what in the in the, the live action series because uh, uh vesemir is more blue or uh, uh what's that color that's in between blue and gray or whatever but uh yeah gray is it just bluish gray, gray. <laughs> Bluish gray, yeah, yeah. So, uh, very cool, yeah. So, I'm, I'm excited for us to to talk about this one and get into it. Um, I see that you added some of our our new faces and places to the dock. Uh, do you want to just switch back and forth? You want to take that first one? Sure, I'll take the first one. Uh, in this, we get sort of a new introduction to a couple new characters, and that's Lambert and Cohen. Uh, we did see them in the last episode, but now we get more of a proper introdu introduction to them. Uh, there are two more of the Witcher brothers. Um, Cohen is the more laid-back Witcher, and uh, Lambert is more of the dickish guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I figured that out, going, going, especially the second time into this episode, going, oh, okay, these are two guys. And I, I didn't get a good count at the end of the episode of how many Witchers we had standing around watching uh, mm -hmm. Siri. Um, I'm so glad you put these in there because I totally spaced on who they were. Uh, Triss, Marigold, and Sabrina. These are these returning uh, characters, but if, if you need a refresher, they were the other mages with Yennefer uh, at Eratusa when she was studying magic. And they were also at the Battle of Sodden Hill. Triss was badly burnt in the battle, and Sabrina had been mine snatched by the worms. The worms. Ew. Yeah, the, the <laughs> worms of... Uh... Of Frangilla, and they got right. into their brains and took over. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I had totally spaced on who they were, and and I actually had it in my notes that I, I hope you figured out who they were and you could explain. Yeah, yeah. And uh, 
Also, we get a sort of new location, but not really. It's a it's a uh, returning location. It's called Zintria, but it seems like a new location. It is actually uh, Sintra, and the Nilfgaardians are now calling it by its elven name of Zintria. Ah, okay. I didn't. I did not catch that. Yes, and all the elves are flocking there for um, sanctuary, basically. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, with that, we can get uh, go right into our top fives. And should I go? Absolutely. Roll the dice? Okay. Yes. Uh, my number five is Jennifer is alive and back at Eratusa. That was so nice when they were talking about the deceased um, mages and they said, we've lost 14. And she stands at the door and says, 13. <laughs> because she hasn't, uh, she's not quite dead yet. <laughs> um, I understand Tazea. The one thing I thought is, you know, I understand Tazea's uh, great respect for Yennefer. I mean, she's almost crying as she's carving her name into that block with all the, the lost mages. But where did this deep love for her come from? Because they always seem to bicker with each other. Yeah, it seemed like kind of a jump, uh, kind of a stretch that all of a sudden, but I think, you know, we got that conversation. Um, it's in this episode or is it the, la the last episode? I guess it was, um, I guess it's in this episode. We get further conversation where I think to say I just realized how how much Jennifer sacrificed mm -hmm. for for that and that's kind of changed her impression of Jennifer maybe and uh, I had this in my discussion points too so um uh if that's all you've got for Jennifer um just the part where she's with the other mages um uh... Tris and Sabrina and, and the other unnamed mage down in the, the pools where the eels are, you know, they, they go down there to um, hot tub, I guess. And I thought they were actually going to be mean girls at first because uh, Sabrina is kind of snarky with her. But but then they show like they really do have respect for her. And I, I love that. I love it when women aren't snarky with each other, but they they actually have more of a sisterhood. Yeah, that was a good scene that even though they kind of, you know, played with her about that she had fire she should be able to heat up the hot tub but then the other girl does it so mm -hmm. they don't really address the fact and and this is this is later on in in the the episode when we we find out that Tasea knows she doesn't have her her magic but i wonder if others are starting to suspect that she may have uh you know burnt out her magic or, mm -hmm. uh, i've noticed that stregobor used that same method to try to get into Jennifer's mind that Tasea used in that first episode. Um, and th that was another interesting turn of events that, uh, uh, and they wanted to prove her loyalty by killing the other prisoner. And it's just, but I, I liked that whole interaction where Jennifer realizes that even if she kills him, then she's a murderer and Stregobor will have another reason, you know, to, to come at her. Mm -hmm. But yet, so she's torn and she ends up breaking him free and they end up uh, escaping together. But I love that we get, now we get confirmation of what the old witch meant about, what did she say about, I'm going to let you cook for a while and let you bake for a little while. She's still in her head and she's still trying to get Yennefer to tell her, to let her be the one that helps her. But I love that at the end, it it wasn't the witch she turned to. She said, I'm saving myself. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was really, really great. So what was your next one? Uh, my next highlight was uh, Siri getting hazed by her big, uh, her rowdy big brothers in quotation marks. <laughs> she's a she's a typical petulant teenager. Uh, she's getting a little irritated with Geralt because he's just moving along too slowly. She wants to run before she can walk. And so, of course, she gets uh, prodded by the boys there at Kaer Moran to... Um, Go and essentially try what I'm calling Witcher Wipeout, <laughs> <laughs> the obstacle course that she has to go on, which is like the game Wipeout, but you don't have the nicely padded obstacles and the warm pool of water to fall into when you when you do fall. Um, and I'm glad it wasn't easy for her, you know? I, I thought, oh, okay, she's she's kind of this special child. I have a feeling like she's just going to ace it right away, but no, she she gets knocked down hard several times. 
Yeah, I had this whole in my notes as well as one of my points. That whole contraption was just amazing how uh, intricate it was and how how big it was. And, you know, obviously it didn't uh, either. It didn't burn with uh, with Kermoran when we had the events of the Night of the, the Wolf or Nightmare of the Wolf, or they were able to rebuild it sometime over uh, the past. I never we don't really get a confirmation of how long it's been. I mean, it, Witchers, I'm assuming they don't age the same way mm-hmm. as regular humans age. So it could have been a hundred years or, you know, it's definitely been decades, but there's must be a point kind of where they, maybe where they even out and, and we have no idea how old Vesemir is. No. You know? Yeah. I'm sure they must've rebuilt it at some point. I mean, it is their, their winter home where they go to relax, but also they have to stay sharp. So I bet they, they rebuilt that course at, over time. Yeah, yeah, and I liked that uh, there was a point in there where, like you said, she didn't she didn't just solve it all of a sudden. You know, she had to to try it several times. She had to fail. Um, you know, I cheered when she got through that first section the first time, but then she you know automatically gets knocked off the next section. And you know, Lambert was actually trying to kind of coach her a little bit there, where he was telling her to you know watch her breathing and you know center herself and and all that stuff. So I thought it was really cool. And it sat, it looked like Geralt started to kind of have a smile on his face when it looked like she was going to finish the course successfully. But then of course she falls off the platform and his so close. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I I thought at first they were really hazing her, but as she kept going and kept going, she they started to build that respect for her. And you're right. Um, I think at one point he, the hazing turns into like persuasion. It's just like, yeah, keep going. You can do it. Or by, by telling her she can't do it, it just pushes her to go and do it some more. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that, you know, she talks to Geralt about wanting more training. And the very next thing we see is she's training with Cohen. You know, the sword mm-hmm. play with Cohen there was really, really cool to see. So it's kind of like all of them are going to kind of band together maybe and help train her a little bit and get her ready. But, you know, and I've got the quote later uh, from Geralt when he tells her that she's not a witcher, though. She doesn't have the special potions and the powers and, and all that stuff. So she's got to be more careful than than the rest. You know, She can't just get out there and do these kind of things. She's got to be careful. Yeah. Uh, well, we learned from Nightmare of the Wolf that... Uh, yeah, you know, Geralt was pretty pretty much going pretty easy on her as far as the training compared to what they went through. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I wonder if they're going to step that up a little bit. I, I hope not because I don't really like to see that kind of toward women. I mean, toward kids or anybody, you know, you don't really want to see that. But so we'll see. Um, I think it's your turn. Um, let's see, where am I at? Um, kind of my first one really that I, I, I had down that we haven't already talked about is that the banter is, is not quite as playful as mm-hmm. it was in the last episode. You know, uh, Lambert is really blaming Geralt for Eskel's death. Uh, that was rough to watch because that's, that's, it's hard enough when you lose a, a compatriot, you know, but to have another one kind of blaming you, uh, was bad. Uh, and I love that we get this reveal that Eskel and Geralt's relationship was really pretty close there. They, they seem to be really good friends and they train together. Um, they have that talk about monsters. And I think it was Eskel or Eskel says, or Geralt, one of them says something about, you know, our job is to rid the world of monsters. We're, we're basically going to put ourselves out of the job, but that'll never happen. And mm-hmm. you remember that was part of the, the storyline from Nightmare of the Wolf, right? Was that the alchemists were the Witcher alchemists were the ones who were mutating these monsters to keep, to make new monsters. So to, it, it, as a way, so I wonder if we're going to get more of that in this, in this season, more of the mutated at, well, as we saw at the end, we saw a mutated Leshy there at the end, not just the one that Eskel had fought with. We saw, you see another one that looks very and I don't even know if that was a Leshy or another monster coming to kill the Leshy. Yeah, that's what I, I was confused about even on my second watch. And I wonder if we're going to see another dissection scene uh, from Yesimir, uh next week in dissecting this new monster to see what it is. And maybe we'll find out what it is or that it's a mutated Leshy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I was going to say something about that, but I lost it. If I figure it out, I'll come back to it. Um, and speaking of that, uh, my number three point was the, the pull from the forest. So, um, you know, Geralt asks Siri, what is it? If you let that feeling, you know, 
continue where is it and she she says it's pulling her to the forest and one more week we get another awesome creature design two awesome creature designs this time from uh you know the makeup department um the leshy <laughs> i thought for just like what came to mind right away to me was it is like a, a baby of Groot <laughs> and <laughs> la, Lor la lorana which is uh it's a mexican latin american uh folk monster folk story about the weeping women a, a vengeful ghost who roams the waterfront areas mourning the children that she drowned it's very gory but uh yeah if you've ever seen the movie um i think it was by james wan she kind of looks like that like tall and gaunt and that's what that leshy looked like it almost looked like it was in a dress but it was all its long roots going into the ground yeah, yeah, and then that other that other creature was, you know, it was another insect like creature, right, crawling around and making those t -t 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 kind of sounds, you know, that I thought was was great, and I love that fight there at the end. I'll talk more about that. In one, kind one, of one, reminded one of me points. of that kind of praying mantis character from the first season that chased Yennefer through all the portals. It it had those kind of. Um, talons or whatever but it also had like multiple creepy demonic eyes and like long human hands which was, was probably the creepiest part about it yeah yeah exactly Whew. uh let's see my next one is to say uh we didn't get anything i i didn't think about it until i started watching this episode we got nothing from to and the people at eratusa in the previous episode uh we just had we just had Geralt and then the Nilfgaardians. And so this one, we don't have anything. Did we get anything from Nilfgaard in this one? Yes. Well, no. yeah, we do. The elves. Okay, yes. Yeah, the elves talking about what they wanted. And, and I had it in my notes. Frangilla and Francesca talking about what the, the witch showed them. That's right. So we did get all three storylines uh, this week. But yeah, she says they didn't get anything from the prisoner and that he has a, a magical block in him, which I thought was interesting. Um and we find out that Yennefer's been gone a month trying to get her magic back. And you mentioned that, you know, to say as she carved those names into the tombstone, and it almost seemed like she waved when she waved her hand, was she maybe taking Yennefer's name off it? Or was it just like a, a, a dismissing kind of gesture? I wasn't sure uh, what, because she said something about, we just, we just etched your name into the stone, into the memorial. And then she waves her hand again. And I don't know if that was her taking the name off or what. Oh, gosh. I'll have to go back and look. I can't remember if she actually erased the name, just ho hoping that, you know, if she gave it a few more days, then Yennefer would show up or if she... No, no I mean, she did it after. No, she did it after Jennifer, Jennifer showed up. Oh. When she's, they were having that discussion, she said she put Yennefer's name on the memorial and then she does another little wave Then, yes, I think hands. she definitely erased her name from the stone. That's all I had for that one. Just just a little quick, that little, again, just this this relationship between Yennefer and Tissaia is, is going to be interesting to track throughout. Because like you said, in the first season, it was very adversarial and they didn't like each other. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, she treated her like, like the pig that she dug out of the pig den <laughs> that she paid three, what is it, three coins for or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But... Also, like I've mentioned before, she's she's kind of one of those teachers who who go tough on you just because they know you can do better. Um, so let's see, my I think I'm on my number two, and this is a term that I never use lightly because there's a distinction between uh, this word and and just being a jerk in general. But uh, Stregobor is a disgusting misogynistic asshole. <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, he is terrible. He condemns and tortures Yennefer. Um, I mean, I understand they were, to say I was torturing a prisoner of war, but he is torturing one of their own to get information. Uh, he demonizes this woman, Falca, in the story that he tells about um, a quarter elven woman who tried to reclaim her throne, according to Istrid, and... Um, Basically, he, he calls her like this woman who tried to destroy this entire civilization, 
But um, I don't know. I don't actually believe that. And Yistrid actually um, uh, challenges him on that. But if you can remember season one, he also uh, charges the murder of Renfri. I mean, he enlists Geralt to kill Renfri because she is this woman who was supposed to be born during the eclipse who... You know, there was a prophecy that a woman, bor a princess born during the eclipse would be like the end of days. And so he went around just collecting all these princesses and keeping them in towers and murdering them and having them attacked and, and abused and ultimately experimented on in autopsied. So he is just absolutely the worst. Yeah. I mean, he's racist and, and everything, mm -hmm. you know, like the whole Elven thing is very very much you know he just doesn't and it's yeah I, I i can't i can't add anything to what you just said you everything you said was exactly perfect I, I was trying to put all that into words myself so i'm glad that you were able to to express it because we really see that we saw a little bit of it in the first season you know when he found out that yennefer had uh, elven blood in her and that kind of made friction between her and um, who was the the what's the guy's name the one that uh, the archaeologist mage that she had a Easter that's Easter okay okay yeah uh, you know she she accuses Easter again of what I'm not going to tell you something so you can just go run and tell it to Stregobor again you know so there's gonna there's still a strained relationship here there between her her and him as well so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, we do find out in that story that he tells that his uh, his hands are just an illusion. He he was yeah, there at that, that event, and his that... hands got burnt off. Yeah, I have that quote actually in my I have the, his quote in my in my notes uh, that I'll when we get there. Uh, but my I, I was thinking, you know what? If his hands were burnt off. I have a feeling that there were there were they were burnt off for a good reason, <laughs> and I have a feeling there's way more to this story than we know right now. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's got to be more to his his just vitriolic uh, feelings toward toward elves and and like I said, it, it's it's not excuse. Yes, it, it's one thing if he was tortured or, but that still doesn't excuse the treatment he had he did of Yennefer and like you said his his just general attitude towards uh the elves so um let's see um i don't know what number i'm at on mine but i want to talk about we had a lot of talk in these last two episodes about the conjunction again we've had it mentioned several times that i'm hoping we're going to see some more of that was where did you see because you said something about the conjunction was when humans and monsters were basically uh snapped in or, or warped into this this universe did you pick that up from the nightmare of the the wolf or was that in those cave drawings we saw um in the last i mean i think i'd else? i'd heard somewhere either in an interview or something that there it was this conjunction that brought humans and monsters into the world but they do mention when they're talking down in the cave and looking at the cave drawings that they they talk about the conjunction conjunction junction what's your function that's, that's what pops in my head every time yes, yes every time every <laughs> that's time. when the monsters appeared okay they didn't okay, say so the yeah, humans but uh Maybe they were talking about both, both, you know, the monsters yeah, I, and the uh, human monsters. <laughs> yeah, so I guess we'll have to just track how much of that story we get uh, throughout the rest of the season. You know, we'll we'll see. But I, I kind of hope we get a little bit more of that, of what what the conjunction was. And because, you know, Grawlt says maybe there'll be another conjunction that'll change the world uh, again. Again. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, I think we're up to your number one. Okay, my number one is Yennefer takes her life and Cahir's into her own hands. Um, so like you said, she was tasked with killing him. And, you know, she says to him that um, death must serve a purpose. So that's why they hadn't killed him yet. And apparently his purpose now is to prove that she's not a spy. Because Stregobor, you know, basically... Um, tells the council that he believes she's a spy because she's she's part elf and that she had been with the Nilf Guardians for over a month so he feels like she's playing a double agent with them so to 
prove that she's loyal to the Brotherhood of Mages. She's tasked with with killing Kahir. Um, and like you said, she so they, they go to this fortress or some sort of ruins. Um, the kings of the north are there and they have built this monument to the fallen mages. Um, I also heard that yeah, they weren't... So there must be a force field or something around there that prevents them from, from doing magic. Yeah, Foltis, we have... So we have the return of King Foltis, who he was this the king with the Striga that we talked about uh, in the last... In the last episode, we have his return, and he and that other king are talking about how, well, what if somebody tries to do magic in here? And I think I think Foltis said something like there there were mages that were putting up wards so that that wouldn't happen. Yeah, yeah. And he he also dropped the line that their most trusted uh, advisors are are less so now. So they obviously suspect the mages. Um, but she does hear the voice of the deathless mother in her head telling her to come to her, you know, telling her uh, what to do. And she literally, you know, takes her, her fate into her own hands by using that axe. And, and she's a pretty good shot there because <laughs> she cuts his bonds without cutting him or, you mm -hmm. know, slicing him down the back or anything. Um, yeah. Yeah, she, she takes him, she hops on the horse. Uh, oh, I thought that was pretty cool too, how she ran through the, the auditorium and smacked down the um, supports holding the, the fires, knocked them down as a distraction, hopped on the horse and, and sort of in a, a, a gender switch, it was her on the white horse <laughs> saving the, the gentleman in distress. <laughs> Yeah, and it seems like now she's going to run to Sintra, and that's going to be her, you know, I mean, I guess she just, I guess she she didn't want to murder him, which I understand completely, but she also saw there was no other way out for her. She, if she didn't kill him, she was going to be, they were going to call her a spy. So she had to break him out and, and escape, basically, uh, to Sintra, or Sintria, as we may start calling it. Zentria? Zentria? <laughs> Zentria? I can't. I can't. I'll let you have all the big words. Um, so my number one is is that ending fight. I think it's almost every week is probably going to be my number ones is that the ending fight there. That it, it was interesting. And you, you talked a little bit about it already about um, Geralt talking to Siri about what's pulling her. And I don't, I don't know if he knew it was going to be the Leshy, Eskel's Leshy. Uh, or if it was that other creature that was pulling her, but I, I just love that that they they get out into the woods and Geralt tells her about what happened um, during her mother's wedding and that 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 power that was revealed in her mother and he thinks it's in her as well, and it was just just another one of those moments between the two of them where she says that she trusts him and he's like it's about time, you know, and but then they get that fight and we get the other creature killing Eskel's Leshy. Mm -hmm. And then we get the vision that she saw at the beginning of being dragged is in there as well. Um, but then we get the other, this other creature that we don't know. I, I thought it was a mutated Leshy, but maybe it's something else. Uh, I thought then, so at first too, but then when I watched it again, you, they flip back to the Leshy and he's actually behind the Leshy slicing it in half. I actually thought the first time I watched it that he came out of the Leshy. Mm, that's what I thought the first time. Yeah. So I, I think you're right. I think he was behind the Leshy. So, so yeah, we'll get, maybe we'll get something more in the next episode of that, of, of that uh, creature, that monster. But yeah, it was, it was really good. And I love that whole cat and mouse kind of thing where it's chasing, it basically was chasing Siri and Geralt just waited for his moment. And the actress playing Siri, gosh, she looked at first, it was fear. It was definitely fear. But then when Geralt saves the day and cuts the thing's head off, you see her fear change. And she's doing that thing where she says, I'm taking hold of the fear and using it, you know. So I thought that was, I thought that whole scene was played really, really great. And again, I can't wait till next week to see if we get uh, Vesemir uh, doing another dissection. <laughs> oh, so many autopsies this year yes. <laughs> and monster autopsies. Um, yes. Yeah. And the one thing that you notice with that, creature um 
is that he could easily kill um, Siri right away, but it seemed to me like he was trying to reach out to her. He had one of his creepy hands, and he was kind of reaching out to her, and she she kind of looked at him for a minute, and then Geralt slices him in half. So I'm thinking that. that this creature somehow wanted to reach out to Siri. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. We'll have to see again what's, uh, so is that all of your points? Have we? Yep. That's all of them. Okay. Uh, let's see. Got any, any more notes that we didn't discuss? I have a few. Um, (laughs) where are all our hums and fucks? (laughs) Last year you could, you could have a drinking game by how many times, uh, Geralt would go, hmm, or fuck. (laughs) So it's like, I've got my drink here. I haven't heard a single one yet. (laughs) Yeah, I tried to do a hmm count um, uh, per episode, but there hasn't been that many. And so we'll have to see if that maybe the writers took that into consideration this season and didn't put as much of that in. Um, I, I thought that that scene with that is that like that burial cave where they took Eskel's body. I thought that was kind of interesting there. And then the wolves come and I couldn't figure out were they just leaving his body for the wolves like That's what I was assuming. Yeah. Okay. You know, they're the school of the wolf. So I the think wolf. maybe so that's yes. what they do with their dead. They they leave them for the wolves. That's that's what it seemed like to me. So Yeah. Um the other thing was uh actually you were talking about last time the colors of the robes and if they meant anything, and I just noticed when they were taught when Frangillo was talking to Francesca this time. Um, you know, she was talking about how the rest of the continent considers them to be imperialist and they see their black armors and, and just believe that they're, they're bad. And I thought, oh, black armor, black robes. So maybe that was why he had the black robes and the person, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. No, I was just agreeing with you. Okay. And the person that was haunting, um, Frangilla's dreams, who I couldn't remember, his name was Amir. Because she mentions it this time to Francesca, um, I just did a minor amount of research because I didn't want to get spoiled. But Amir is the Emperor of Nilfgaard. That's his name. He is the White Flame. The white, the white flame. They keep talking about. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I that whole conversation I loved uh, the second time around, especially of them discussing what they what they each saw in their kind of visions and that uh, what they kind of wanted for the future. And Frangilla says, you know, she doesn't want to be considered, uh, like you said, imperialistic or attacking. We want to, we were liberating people. And then uh, Francesca says, she just wants the elves to have a home, you know, which I thought was, was, you know, she said, is Nil- is Nilfgaard, is that going to be a home for us when this is over? And I, Ah, uh, thought that was great. Or they want to be given a home somewhere. I mean, it's like a lot of, um, you know, dispossessed peoples. It's like they just want to find a safe home somewhere where they're not ha- going to have to live this nomadic life being, you know, tossed out of town from town. Um, I think that is all of my notes. I already talked about King Folsted and the conjunction. Um, any other notes for you? One minor note. Why is there a dead rat hanging from Siri's wall? <laughs> if you, you see I could not I could not figure out what was going on there. <laughs> you see um Geralt, he's mending her wounds and just behind him there's just a rat tacked up on the wall. I don't know, maybe she just killed it as a sign to the other rats or, or you know, know i had a friend in college who did that we i went to a school for a while in new york and we had to our dorms were this really old kind of dirty building and uh, i never had them because i i think i was nice to them and i refused to kill them but uh some of my neighbors had cockroaches <laughs> so oh. my uh one of my friends one time killed a cockroach and he left it laying on the floor in his dorm room for a week as a warning to the other cockroaches. <laughs> nice. Um so let's see. I only have a couple of quotes here. I'm not sure what I um I left mine in my my notes. I didn't put them in the docs. So um I've got that one that you mentioned from Stregobor. He says, a historian should know bloodlines better, but history does have a way of repeating itself, doesn't it? And I was there. I was there when Falca destroyed Mirth and all the mages in it. Her violence etched here. And then he holds up his hands and we see, like he said, that his hands dis- are actually illusions. And he says forever. So. Yikes. Well, for that, I've got a, 
I've got a Stregobor quote too. And it says, the only certainty on the continent, my boy, is that no one is ever what they seem. And I feel that's a bit foreboding. And I have a feeling that Stregobor is, well, he's probably pretty much what we see, but he's probably something more as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Especially like, how does he eat with illusion hands? I I also wondered how he was able to touch um, Yennefer and get into her mind because he touches her shoulder to get into her mind. But I'm like, those are illusion hands. Yeah. Illusion hands don't work, do they? Maybe they are physical. I don't know. I I didn't think about it until just now when we were talking about it. So magical Um, prosthetics. (laughs) <laughs> My only other one is the one we kind of already mentioned, and this is when uh, Geralt is, is mending uh, Ciri's wounds, and he says, You can do anything. Doesn't mean you have to. When a witcher cracks his skull, all we need do is stick him in a cot and fill him with Victrum, Spurge, and Hawthorne. Chances are he'll survive. You do not have that luxury. No, she does not. <laughs> that's why she needs to stop thinking that she's invincible, but... Exactly. <laughs> that's what young people think. <laughs> uh... Uh, hey, Steve, what's the difference between a witcher and a heap of shit? Go on. <laughs> Eventually, the shit will stop smelling. Bum bum. <laughs> Little witcher humor from Lambert there. And then what was the one that that uh, that Siri said? What was the other one? He said, uh, "What do you call it? What do you call a witcher uh, without any brains?" And she says, "Lambert." Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Just like brothers and sisters, they're good at mm-hmm. uh, harassing each other. Um, I, my last two quotes are Tesea saying, what's lost is lost, which is the title of this episode. And not only lost as far as her magic, which I'm hoping it's not lost because she is awesome with it. But it's almost like, you know, she's kind of saying what's lost is lost. You can't get that again. You have to find a new way to live. Um, just the same way that in the first season, um, the dragon told Yennefer that she would never get her womb back, so she would never be able to have children. And God, how awful is that, that you give up something that special and important to get power, and then you lose all your power? Yeah, I missed that quote. I I missed doing a mic drop on that one. It's lost is lost. (laughs) It's lost is lost. And my very last one, we've said it already, but I thought it was so great, is uh, when Ciri gets knocked down off the obstacle course and she's looking up at Geralt for, for, you know, some sort of uh, recognition for what she's done. And he just looks at her and says, so close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That total, that look from her of, of approval of of whatever she wanted him to be proud of her, mm-hmm. and he's just like, mm, no. <laughs> uh, so uh, again, I didn't see any any uh, feedback in any of the usual places, so uh, we will skip over that. And uh, when we get to the end, we'll tell what, where our listeners can uh, give us some feedback. And uh, but let's get. Uh, I the only podcast recommendation. I have is uh, Strange Indeed is back and Rima and Paik uh, are covering You Season 3. Um, I actually haven't watched You Season 3, but I did start listening to their their coverage today just to hear kind of what the new season is about. And I'm kind of excited to see if I can find a way to, to dig into it and send them some feedback. So that's uh, Strange Indeed on the Podcastica Network. Yeah, I needed, I wanted to start that a couple of days ago, but I'm going to start that this weekend because that show is crazy. Um, I will promote, finally, our my episode with Mark over at Adrenaline Cinema Podcast is out. We are covering The Fifth Element, if you want to go over there and give it a listen. And also just wanted to throw a shout out to our friends Derek, Chris, and John over at TV Podcast Industries. They have just put up their full coverage of The Witcher. If you have already watched the entire series and need to hear about it right now, you could take uh, listen to their podcast. Yeah, I look forward to listening to them when we get when we get finished uh, with ours, going back and, and checking that out. So, um, 
As always, you are listening to us on your podcast player of choice. If there's an opportunity to give us some a review there, we would love to hear that. Um, we would read it here for sure. We have a website, which is panels to pixels podcast.com. We have a Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash panels to pixels. We are on Twitter, panels to pixels. That's panels, the number two, and pixels. And then we have an email address, panels to pixels one at gmail.com. Panels to pixels one, the TO is spelled out right there in the middle, the number one at gmail.com. We are on YouTube. You can find us on YouTube if you search Panels to Pixels podcast. Please give us a thumbs up. We are on Instagram at Panels 2 TO Pixels podcast. Check out our other podcasts on the Next Level Online Radio Podcast Network. Whew. <laughs> We highly recommend them. Wilhelm, The Spotlight with Ben Beck, The Melting Pat, Lost, We Have to Go Back, Podcast Zero, and so much more. Go to nextlevelradioonline.com and check them out there. So next time we will be back with the next episode of The Witcher Season 2. So Laura, Laura, you have already given your podcast, but what is your podcast proposal of the week? Okay. Last week, it was charcuterie boards. Uh, this week, I'm thinking, you know, true podcast, uh, true true crime prop podcasts like Serial, Dirty John, and My Favorite Murder are kind of a big deal. So here's, here's a podcast proposal. How about Tales of True Traffic Crimes podcast? <laughs> it'll, it'll be a hit. People calling about, uh, you know, road rage because they're driving around behind little old ladies or <laughs> no, I'd listen to it. I'd give it a chance. <laughs> I'd listen and to maybe five always, minutes of it. <laughs> as always, I send voicemails to uh, uh, various podcasts when I have the time right now. Uh, I think book of Boba Fett is about the only one I'm able to get to at the moment, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. So much TV, so little time. There is. Thank you everyone for listening. I'm Steve. I'm Lara. This was Panels to Pixels, and we will see you on the next panel. Good night. Good night.